On the 15th of January uh, 2022, I was on a Saturday. Uh, I just got back with the kids. I just barely entered the house when the first explosion happened. The first impact was a pop in our ears. It kind of shook the house because I see the window was shaking. All of a sudden you hear noise coming out of everywhere. And then a earthquake uh, happened right after the first spin. We can see the cloud of you know ash like go, going through. It's just like a mushroom cloud of ashes. And then once the cloud was covering the sky, then we started seeing the darkness coming from the other, from the eastern side of Tonga. That's when everything went black. After that, it just went black. And we all panicked. Run. It's a tsunami. There's a tsunami coming in. It was devastating. The confusion, I think that's the best way to describe this. It's just pure confusion. Um, I can also hear a few kids from the neighbor, they were crying. All we did was pray and we didn't know what to expect. I thought to myself, oh no, this is, you know, that day that that those people are talking about in the Bible. We were totally devastated. We felt it was the end of the world. My kids are still traumatized from the event. Uh, whenever they hear a loud sound or the thunder, they'll run. I would not wish my worst enemy to go through that. The massive eruption of an underwater volcano in the Pacific has seen Tonga's capital flooded by a tsunami and covered in ash. Planes carrying aid can't land because ash has rendered the runway unusable. The underwater eruption was so powerful that it was detected around the world. A blast so massive it was seen from space. Which scientists think is a one in a thousand year event for this sort of volcano. While the eruption was so big it severed Tonga's only fiber optic cable which connects the country to the world cutting all communications. We are all a bit in the dark about exactly the scale of the damage or what people are experiencing. Well, this natural disaster was unprecedented. We have never had anything like this before, so there's no frame of reference. We're used to, to cyclones. We're used to earthquakes, but not um, volcanic eruptions. The tsunami, um, we refer to it as Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai. Tsunami was one of the most uh, bizarre <laughs> events that the world might have been um, you know, a witness because uh, it was caused by a uh, volcanic uh, eruption. As we know that, that tsunami are usually caused by um, earthquake. This made it different because we did not expect it. It was out of nowhere. For tropical cyclones, we get a warning. We get an early warning. So uh, we get to prepare. If we want to ev evacuate to higher grounds, we do that. But this was unexpected and it was uh, very, it happened so quick. Um, it made it different. So we were panicking. Uh, we didn't know what to do. <laughs> Oh my god, we are not prepared for this. Most of our scenarios were driven by, you know, tsunami caused by an earthquake. So we didn't anticipate that there would be another problem with ash fall. We saw everything in, in slow motion and without understanding. The only thing that we can relate to is that it's the end of the world. It was just confusion and fear. Mind you, it's a small country. There's a chance that you're related to someone in every village in this country if you're Tongan. And when the natural disaster happened, that's the one thought on your mind is, our families, are they okay? Where to run? This country is small. If we had a tsunami of a larger magnitude, I won't be surprised if it goes from one end to the other end of the island. 
Where do you run in that kind of situation? That fear that it brings out, it, it was terrifying. It was unprecedented in the sense that all of us were frightened. I didn't know how to stabilize the mind of my children and the stability of the family and the people who follow me when I myself don't know what to do. So I, we were all affected in that sense. Yeah? How do you prepare for something like this? But trying to survive. So the, the, the answer is that we weren't prepared. I think the whole of Tonga um, we weren't, I mean, we weren't prepared for something like this. stand along the coast. Yeah, when the tsunamis came, most of the cemeteries that do stand at the coast were all just wrecked. Bones everywhere, all the graves were open, filled with water. It was sad seeing relatives and families coming and collecting all the remains of their loved ones. You could just see them crying while looking for everything. Yeah, and it was quite sad. Well, I never forget. And uh, this is the first time I, I seen this uh, battle wave. And I told you what, it still gets in my mind sometimes I went to sleep. I wake up in the middle of uh, the night. I was sweating. Look like I'm running from nowhere to somewhere. <laughs> We are a strong Christian country and it's a belief and our faith in God that came in to play a really vital role at that moment in keeping stability in people's mind, in people's heart and just having some divine hope because there was just no hope. Nobody knows what to do. In terms of the islands, um, Tongataku, the main island, also he, uh, Ewa and part of Hapai. It's like looking at a black and white movie. <laughs> on, on the next day, yeah? it's like looking at a black and white movie. We woke up around six or so, and the ashes was about this thick outside, all the way up the stairs. And I remembered when I was, we were trying to clean them, I remembered counting and I thought, said to myself, I will count it to see how many sweep I'll do for one spot to clean this. 50. I'll stay in one spot and sweep it 50 times until that thickness of dirt can be shifted. It took us almost three months to get rid of the volcanic ash, but you don't really get rid of it. I think you still see uh, some lingering um, <laughs> here in the main island. Us here in Tonga, about 80 to 90 percent, we get our uh, drinking water from um, rainwater. So that's how we collect that water for drinking. After the, the event, we have to clean our water tank and wait for like one month before we can receive any rain in our water tank. Uh, one of the key um, impact of the ash fall was also on the infrastructure because the ash covered all the, the, the roads and you have to be really careful on the road as well. And the airports were also uh, didn't uh, receive any um, um, airplane landing um, for a week. Even the hospitals were badly uh, affected. The truth is our government system simply lack the capacity to fully handle any full-blown uh, natural disaster of that scale. And we did an in inventory of uh, the equipment that we had, and we had none. We had none appropriate to clean up uh, volcanic ashes and, and even uh, remove bulky waste from um, uh, tsunami-affected areas. Eh? 
So we make do with what we had at the time. Well, that was all the new buildings that the government were putting up to, so they could relocate the people from the smaller islands in the front there that were affected by the tsunami. So all their houses and all that in the island were all wiped out. So yeah, the government stepped in to relocate them over here to the main island. From a national emergency uh, management office perspective, the first uh, key challenges was always shelter, um, food and water as well. Uh, make sure that the that, 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 um, private household, the families, you know, have enough shelter and have somewhere uh, safe to, to sleep and to eat and to time uh, and to stay. Especially um, some of them are evacuated in some of the evacuation centre. So we always have to check those. Uh, and then we move on to the, to the waste management side of things, which is also one of the key areas that we were looking at. Normal reaction of any a community is that straight after a disaster is trying to get to normal as soon as possible and that starts with clean up you clean up your place uh, salvage what uh, what can be salvaged uh, for reuse and then get rid of um, try to get rid of the waste and try to rebuild it eh? and that's what we did For the Nobles Sticky, the, the first response was just like everybody else, is that we have to get up, assess the environment, what was going on, how are we going to clean up all this, and we helped each other. So we cleaned our own homes first, and we all moved as a community into the, um, onto the roads and cleaned the roads together. It somehow was a blessing in disguise because it brought everybody together to the road. Yeah? So we helped each other clean the whole place. If not for the Tongan community, we would still be in that recovery stage of cleaning up ashes to this day. So for us staff in the Waste Authority office, we had to go out and um, assist the communities, help them with picking up rubbish. And this took one week for us. Wow. So we were very honored um, and we, uh, to help the communities uh, with the cleanup after this uh, tragedy. It was pretty much just trying to clear out the roads, you know, so for the distribution of aid and Drinking water, tents, all those, all the supplies that everyone needed. One of the assistants came in was water. And of course they came in bulk of bottles of water made of plastic. And that's when No Plastic was like, oh, that is not really um, going to help with, with, our, um, with our movement to control and manage uh, single-use plastic in Tonga. What are we going to do about it? So instead of just mobilizing our, um, our normal communities, which is here in Nukualofa, we mobilized the whole of Tongatapu. We mobilized them in two days to collect an equivalent of three tons of compacted uh, plastic litter into balers, and we managed to put them back into one of the Australian um, HMS uh, Canberra, and it took it out of Tonga. Something that you would find out here in Tonga is this strong sense of community. It can't be helped with a country this small. You have church leaders who have influence over their own districts. You have town officers who have influence over their own districts as well. So when they all banded together to get these communities to work together, every day you've had 
youth groups either sweeping the streets, getting all the ashes compiled together. You've had um, families visiting homes to aid in the cleanup efforts. So everyone came together, regardless of their differences, just to get this, uh, overcome this challenge. Father, <laughs> Hearing that they clean up the, the, um, some of the international community, sending some of their expertise to assist with the cleaning up of uh, the waste management, especially dealing with asbestos, uh, you know, really assessing whether this asbestos um, exists in those houses they were damaged. They also uh, used some of their resources, uh, like some of their um, navy boats uh, came in to, to take those uh, asbestos and uh, we call it discard or you know, dispose it in a proper way. They also help out with the other cleanup, uh, the ashes in some of the infrastructures like the airport and some of the wharves. They really help to make sure that you know, the, the wharf um, is fit for, for those huge ships to come in. The waterfront area and the eastern side, there was a lot of rubbish. Um, plastic, um, household rubbish, um, hazardous uh, waste. So it was a very um, tragic uh, experience for us to see these uh, waste and the huge amount of waste that was uh, left or created by this event. We did see an increase of 32% in waste input towards our landfills. We, we of course keep a record of each and every truckload going into our landfills. So we, for that month of January to February and to March, we did see a sharp increase in waste input. It took some time, of course you, would, you might wonder why the waste rolled over these few months because the recovery efforts did take time. We also at the same time had multitude of uh, aids coming from overseas in the form of uh, relief, uh, relief packages, water, food, and that did produce a higher output of waste too as, in a, as a um, result. That was pretty much the first things that everybody was trying to get was access to drinking water, turn electricity back on, then try to establish communications. Our communication with the international community was pretty much cut off and we have to rely on other means such as, such as the satellite phones. A lot of our systems that were reliant on technology were redundant. This includes our banks. They couldn't issue payments to people because their systems are all hosted online on servers that link back to their main branches overseas. Payments could not go through our billing system for our customers could not be implemented but of course we did do things the old-fashioned way went back to manual our operations man uh, manager had to hand carry the uh, salaries of all the outer island branches to each island throughout this period of time as soon as the communications were cut out they knew to expect that their salaries would be coming there on a the boat despite the fact that we could not talk to each other. And that's a level of teamwork that I'm really proud of. Learn 
from us. We came into this unprepared, severely unprepared. The response to the tsunami was great, but we were fortunate that it was that the impacts were not greater than what it could have been. From this experience, we need to consider all scenarios that could go tsunami. So for us, it, the scenarios that we'll build before were actually based on having an earthquake from the Tonga Trench. So for, for us, this experience has taught us that it could be both ways. Um, and I think it's also good to have a disaster waste management in plan, uh, just to guide um, all the government agencies, private sectors, even the communities, how to respond um, to a post-disaster uh, event, such as uh, the Honga Tonga Honga Hawaii uh, volcanic eruption. So I think um, the community awareness is one of those key uh, areas that we are trying to be really strong about now, like providing them with more information, you know, early warning system, how do you get out of this kind of situation, how do you prepare yourself as, as, as a community before the first responder or the government can reach you, how do you make sure you're, you're safe, you know, you're, you're more prepared. We have the early warning system in place now, so we test it every Friday. So these sirens are installed to um, warn us if, the, if there are tsunami uh, uh, coming or any earthquakes. Uh, it could give us some time to prepare if any um, event would happen again. I would really love to encourage other Pacific Islands to be um, engaged more with the community level, you know community awareness training program so for me that's one of the key uh, disaster preparedness activity especially for waste management uh, community have a way of of doing things that us from a national uh, level they didn't really think they can do that but they have a way of doing things uh, more efficiently and effectively so yeah so I would love to see um, the increased number of evacuation centers in Tonga uh, through fundings um, or international assistance and for these facilities or evacuation centers to have um, equipment for disability access uh, for elderly for young kids and just for everyone because we only have a few uh, and these few centers did not cater for the huge amount of people that were evacuating to higher ground it brings home to mind that only by working together, it's not just Nemo, it's the whole of Medic, it's the whole of the Tonga Police, His Majesty's Armed Force, Tonga Fire and Emergency Services, Mori Tonga, Tonga Red, Red Cross Services, all our Tonga partners. If we had not been able to work together, together with the communities, we would not have been able to come through um, this disaster. But yeah, I think working together with whatever uh, resources that we have will will just help us be more resilient and not be dependent.